Aloha. This is a discussion show you're watching and it's on um, politics for the people. I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton, and we have a panel of guests to help with our discussion. And I'd like to introduce them now. We have Jay Fidel, we have Tim Apicella and Winston Welch, and we also have Karen Buzzard. So welcome panel guests. Appreciate your being here for this discussion today. And our topic is uh, about uh, what basis it is that homegrown war crimes claim to have. So to get right into what is what we're going to be talking about, let's ask Jay, um, do you hear war crimes, war cries? And if you do, um, through the media or otherwise, who's who's crying war? Uh, I couldn't tell whether you're talking about war crimes or war cries. Cries. War what, 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 yeah, what, when you say war crime, means somebody calling for violence. But if you're talking about war crimes, well, that's I guess that's violence. That's um, that offends the, the sensibilities more somehow. Yeah, I, I see both. I see both. Um, you know, there are war crimes going on all over the world, and and they usually start with, um, you know, war cries. War cries evolve into war crimes, you know. Important point. Yeah. 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 Well, so, well, I mean, if Trump, Trump gets up there and, and calls for violence, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who respond to that. I mean, my favorite comment is by a newscaster this past week who said, who said he has the power to kill by a whisper, he can speak to his base, some of those many armed people, and have a little sort of conspiratorial arrangement where this person goes out and kills somebody. That Trump's whisper. Um, and you know, it's, it's true, that's the way it would happen. Trump, Trump said uh, that he had the power to kill somebody in Fifth Avenue um, without being accountable. Um, but it wouldn't work that way. He wouldn't do it. He'd have somebody else do it. And you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. That's the way he sets things up. And that's what, one of the reasons the insurrection investigation is so interesting, because he has his proxies, his acolytes do it for him. But the, if, the, you know, if the question is whether he's calling for violence, he is calling for violence. And if the question is whether there are people out there who would abide by his call, who would hear the dog whistle, there are. You know, I, I, I don't know if I'd say millions, but enough to really, you know, create chaos. And the, um, the other question is, when would this happen? And um, I think about that because I believe it's going to happen. And I think it's um, and what you do is uh, you wait for a provocation and, and then you strike. Um, and uh, what, like what he did in, in his attempts at the coup, he used the uh, you know, the, the power of, of government agencies. Uh, he couldn't do that in 2022, um, but maybe later. In 2022, this year, for the elections, um, if the Republicans have their way, they're going to do outrageous things. And the African-Americans and others will be mighty offended and will go out into the streets. Uh, not to say that that's going to get them anywhere, but they'll go out into the streets and and then you have the problem of um, of one side in the streets, and then whether you know the other side responds. If the other side does respond, the government responds or has to respond. Or if you know the mm, when say the, the the liberals go out in the street and the uh, and the racists uh, meet them there in the street, um, what you have is street violence. And well, who's the and who exactly will stop it? So I think it's coming. Yeah, and, and who, who is going to do it? So you mentioned all Republicans, and you mentioned Trump is calling for it. So who is making these words shout? Out, who's shouting out these words? When when who are these people that are are actually? Well, they're, they're the insurrectionists. Uh, they're the uh, white supremacists. They're the Second Amendment people. Um, they, that's what they do. And they're Trump. just waiting. They're still organized. They haven't gone away. I mean, the news seems clear that they're still out there. And uh, and you remember Merrick Garland. Everybody remember Merrick Garland? 
try hard to remember Merrick Garland. Yeah, I, you can do it. Um, Merrick Garland, uh, you know, his efforts at uh, prosecuting them really haven't stopped them, haven't stopped, haven't really prosecuted seriously enough of them, haven't prosecuted the managers of that insurrection. And, and uh, in fact, they're growing. I, I think that's the real news. They're growing. And when the time comes, they'll be out there. Well, you know, I see Tim is animated. Yeah. Um, He's always animated, <laughs> Stephanie. The poor bugger can't help himself. <laughs> Thank you for that, Jay. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, you know, I, I am reacting to what Jay's saying. And, it, you know, he's mentioning who's starting the, you know, the, the fire here. Um, it's Donald Trump. And, and, and I also, Jay said, well, the minorities will go out in the street and then they'll be met with the white supremacist. I think it's the white supremacists go out in the street and not only the supremacists, but people who are, who are agitated. And, and why are they agitated? Well, on January 15th, Donald Trump, and I saw this video with my own eyes, he said, and I, I won't exactly quote it, but I'll summarize it. He said, um, if you're white, you're being withheld, uh, you're being withheld vital life-saving COVID medicine. And if you're white, you're going back to the end of the line. And so what he was doing, he was basically telling his, his followers, his white followers, that uh, if you're sick, too bad, because you're white, you're not going to give a life-saving medicine. So what happened a week later? Um, a group of uh, Nazis went outside a, um, a hospital saying, you're killing white people. Now, that's Donald Trump, our former president of the United States, doing this. Um, if Charles Manson was alive, remember Charles Manson, uh, you know, the helter skelter thing that he was so ex excited that see happened, which was a race war. Um, he'd probably be pretty pleased with Donald Trump. Uh, so it's not just these uh, splinter groups that are trying to um, fan the flames of a potential war. It's our former president himself. Thank you. That's uh, very interesting. Um, I wanted to ask um, Winston, um, do you think that do, what do you think is the basis then for these cry, cries for war? What is the basis for it, to, uh, Winston? What do you think? Uh, are You're you muted. You're muted. Honestly, uh, I, you know, there's, I don't know that there's too many cries for war. I think really, like Jay has said, do you like going to the dentist? Do you like going to Costco? Do you like having rule of law? the overwhelming huge majority of people in the entire world like those types of things, uh, including in this country. And while there may be some uh, lunatics on, on the fringe calling for this, that, or the other, because they're in some insane, uh, uh, I, I'm going to call it uh, just a news bubble. It's not even news, uh, just uh, an insane loop of where they're getting information and living in an alternate reality. That may exist, but, uh, you know, our, I, our fellow countrymen and women, whether they're considered themselves to be Democrat or Republican or independent or, or, or none of the above, um, they're not crying out for war. They're crying out for sane government solutions, uh, sane society, civic society. What they got to do is also step up because they, they, they're they often saying, well, they need to do something about this or they need, to, but the they is the we. The they is the we. So when people say they need to do this or they need to do that, they don't need to look any further than their own um, face in the mirror and uh, step up for civic change and get involved, as I as I often preach on these shows. Uh, it's up to us individually, but I don't hear cries for war, and I don't expect that we're going to devolve in any type of situation like that. And in fact, if there were any uh, level of violence that was at any meaningful level, you would immediately have, I mean, uh, you, you saw this in Portland a couple years ago, right, with the... Um, uh, this so-called Antifa and then the, the white supremacist or, or whatever the, the version of their the KKK that came in um, uh, into town to fight those folks, the, that if it weren't 
put down by the Oregon National Guard, it would be, or the city, it would be put down by federal troops, which is what Donald Trump threatened to do. And that's actually probably the more realistic and uh, scenario here is that if there were some sort of violence on any level where you had just uh, two lunatic groups uh, uh, fighting each other with violence, then you would have a call for uh, public order to be um, implemented. And then from there, who knows where that then backs down? How do you back out of those sorts of uh, situations? And that's really where I see the main danger is that it, it, it gives a pretext for an increasing sort of uh, fascism or, or takeover on a level that um, that we don't understand or have in this country and haven't had. Uh, but that's that's where I see it. I don't see that our neighbors are going to be you know, going to violence because one of them voted for Hillary and the other one for the Donald. It, 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 I, I just don't see I I would hope that could never be an eventuality. Well, I'm hearing you say that if there is any such violent eruption, it would be something more on the order of intercommunal violence that that would be uh, immediately sprouted, to, uh, you know, sp sprayed with water and go away. Well, Karen, do you also see it that way? Or what are you thinking about those? Uh, I guess I agree more with uh, Winston. I, I see it as having you know, growing up in Missouri and knowing a lot of these people, I don't see them uh, getting out their guns and, you know, marching around, whatever. I do uh, think that uh, there are extremist groups that are increased by, you know, Facebook and the other media whose algorithms basically target them and then feed them conspiracy theories over and over and over again. Uh, so they get more and more, you know, incited and I could see, you know, some white wing supremacist groups, that kind of thing, um, trying to stage something, but I don't really see the general populace at war. So I'm hearing you say that if there's anything, it would be small scale, something uh, small scale, not full blown civil war, or maybe we're moving into Cold War. Jay, what do you think about that? Cold War? Well, I'm reminded. I'm reminded of, um, of the the, the uh, panel program that Tim uh, hosted, chaired a couple of days ago, where a very sophisticated political science guy, who was uh, you know the dean of political science of UH Manoa for years, decades, uh, Neil Neil Milner, he began his comments by saying, "It's inevitable that we will have a civil war." What he didn't. That's what he said. Uh, you can go look at it. There's a Tuesday show. Um, it was uh, What Now America for a special super show. Anyway, um, uh, Neil's comment was incomplete in a sense because he did not define what is a civil war, uh, the civil war that he thinks is coming. And uh, I think it's worth spending a little time on that. You know, it could be, you know, pockets of violence hither and yon. Um, in, maybe in the cities, but not in the rural areas. Uh, it could be uh, pockets of violence that turn into larger violence. Um, it could, it, it's probably not geographic, but it could turn into geographic. You know, we don't have a Mason-Dixon line, um, but, you know, we, we do have the ability to go to other parts of the country to get away from what we don't like. So maybe, um, you know, a philosophical difference turns into um, a geopolitical difference. But I, I don't think there's really any doubt that the election in November is going to be a mess in many, many states. Um, and I think people are going to be mighty offended by that. And I think whether, you know, you bring in the, um, the supremacists first or you, or you bring in the people who are offended, the racial minority, the, the African-Americans first, um, it'll be in the streets. And once it's in the streets, it's like the genie. It's hard. It's hard to contain it. It's hard to go back. And I think we, we are on, you know, here in Think Tech, we try to connect the dots. One thing about the dots is they keep on moving forward. It doesn't go back. It doesn't return to normalcy or a better time. Um, there's nobody out there that's able to achieve that. We can only stave off, um, you know, the inevitable contention. And I think the contention is coming soon, and I think the contention will reflect in violence. And the uh, and the right thinking people don't carry guns around with them. Uh, the right thinking people, you know, are at risk. They're the victims of this. 
Um, and they are not going to have a lot to say when they face somebody in the street or at home who has a gun. Um, and I think that, sorry, but I think that's where we're going. And I don't think there's much we can do about it. I, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I am. Um, I, I, I don't think there's much that the right thinking people can do about it. We have to rely on the government. The government doesn't seem to be able to actually address this. Uh, and so we're, it's, up to, it's up to fate right now. Well, thank you, Jay. And um, well, Tim, you know, I, uh, our, our politics are toxic. Um, the question is, are they so, are the positions of the side so intractable that the only problem solving mechanism we have left is war? So in a way, having some uh, speaking to the unlikelihood of war is very hopeful. Does this persuade you in your thinking to, about it? Well, I, I'm getting hung up. I'm sorry. I'm getting hung up, hung up, hung up on semantics here. And I, I, you know, I don't see all out war. What I see is a slow strangulation of our democratic principles to the point where it won't be war in the streets. It'll be, you know, a vote here and there in the Senate that uh, takes away the rights that you and I enjoy today. Um, it's a slow moving, I, I think it's a slow moving um, erosion of our principles and it won't happen overnight. It'll, it'll take time. Um, so that's, you know, if that's war, then I guess that's war, but I, I don't see it quite in the same light as a sudden cataclysmic event. I see it, um, you know, slow draining process. Okay, thanks for um, moving this along uh, to um, be perhaps a different approach to, to for controversy to go. In other words, I was going to suggest the examples of South Africa and Northern Ireland, uh, Ireland and, um, and, and the Middle East, uh, that they, they go towards these other categories, as you say, the Cold War, the Civil War. Well, I think we'll have incidents of violence. Um... You know, we'll have pockets of, of violence. Um, we won't have, you know, a, an exact January 6th insurrection at the Capitol, but we'll see as things get uglier and, and a little bit tougher, we'll see incidents of violence. And, um, but does that constitute a war in the streets? No, I don't think it does. Um, Winston, are, we, are Americans ready for this to, to go this way? Do no, you... Amer no, no, Americans are ready for the exact opposite. That's why they chose Joe Biden. He's baking soda. We need to be part of the baking soda. Look, this, this country is armed to the teeth. It has been for decades. Uh, and it's interesting. I was just looking at, as we were talking on a Gallup's poll um, of who owns a gun and who doesn't own a gun. Well, of course, men own it more than women. Um, and more interesting, I thought, was uh, that the more money you make, the more likely you are to own a gun. Um, conservatives own guns more. Married people own guns more, which I find interesting. Um, if, those that identify as conservative may also do own uh, guns more, according to Gallup. And when we talk about war, I think we should, uh, Tim mentioned semantics. I think we need to be a part of toning down the, the, the verbiage used here because if uh, and if you want to use that then we we'd say uh, according to Merriam Webster's our American great dictionary the second definition is a state of hostility conflict or antagonism as uh, that's 2A. 2B is a struggle or competition between opposing forces for a particular end. We're in that right now, so we could call it war. I don't think it's particularly useful. I think we can say that this nation has a history of hopefully a competition for uh, the best ideas to percolate to the top. We aren't living up to our ideals right now. We're uh, in some uh, dangerous territories with some uh, demagogues. All of that is true, but no, the, the huge majority overwhelming majority of Americans have people in their families, their neighbors, their friends, their co-workers who cross political spectrums, um, who cross all kinds of spectrums. And that is not going to change. And they're not going to start harming each other because, you know, one of them voted for the Donald. I just don't see it. And if it does happen, then God help us all. But I think we need to be part of that Joe Biden baking soda solution as much as we can be. But what about the insurrection at 
the insurrection at the Capitol? What about the other assaults in the other states on their capitals? Okay, Michigan. We are, we are turning a dangerous blind eye to that right now. And that really, really needs to be addressed because who wants to run for public office or even a school board, given the lunatics that show up there and they are unpunished? I, I mean, my feeling is, uh, you know, a person who believes in liberal democracy is those types of people, the enemies of of a of a open public discourse where people feel the need to physically threaten each other with violence to, to elected officials need to be arrested and incarcerated uh and and stomped out like the fire that the dangerous fire that they are they 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 cannot be allowed to to run rampant like they have been and there's not a lot of stomach for it right now unfortunately okay winston what are they doing about that now is anybody taking care of that business of locking these people up or at even just putting them through the judicial system, what? So you're saying this is what happens. Has it happened? We're seeing slow, uh, slow begrudging moves by the Department of Justice. They say they'll cast a wide net and get everybody on January 6th. But what about what happened in Michigan at the state house there? Um, you know, this is these sorts of things they need. They they are tracking these groups uh, across, you know, go to the Southern Poverty and Law Center. The FBI is tracking these extremist groups across the board. Whether or not they're going to do anything about it remains sort of an open question. But I think for the huge majority of Americans, they find this behavior, this ideology of, of extremism reprehensible. And uh, they are more likely than not, if they found out something, to call up on their friends, family, or neighbors if they found Found something like that. And I think we see evidence of that in the real world. As far as it being gotten away with on the fringes, it happens all the time, way too much. It leads to um, uh, very bad outcomes and it inflames everything. So we need to have a much stronger response for these uh, very anti-democratic and violence prone people just because they're, they're, they're criminals, I mean, at that level. Uh, and that's the way that we need to view it. Okay, well, thank you. Um, Karen, do you see that there's a huge proportion of Americans that feel uh, the way Winston has described us as um, pursuing our democratic and constitutional principles? Uh, what is that huge proportion that's going to come in and call 911 and also vote the right way? Is well, it? Well, uh, as I see it, I think that the, um, the there needs to be much more a lot of this um, gearing up toward war is perpetrated by the media. And I think there need to be much tighter regulation also of the media, including Facebook needs to be broken up. And um, you know, this would, I think, go a lot towards, and even Fox News, uh, I think, needs to be addressed. You can't just, uh, even though in the name of free speech, uh, allow them to you know, post and say incendiary things. So I think there needs to be a much tighter, because we don't really speak to each other in person anymore. It's all through these mediated means. Or we get our information in that way as well. So uh, for me, I think um, I saw where, for example, the FCC consists of, uh, you know, five uh, people. And right now they have um, two Democrats, two Republicans. But Biden's nominee to break the tie, which would allow net neutrality to come back into place, which was dissolved under Trump, uh, they won't let her nomination go forward. So it's that kind of thing that's, I think, holding things up because if the internet were regulated like a public utility rather than an information source, then it would fall under the guidelines of the FCC. And you know, a lot. Some of this could be content could be ad addressed. That's interesting. So, all right. So, since that nominee is held up, what is it that we can do? How, where are all of these uh, safety nets going to be thrown uh, or put up? With with that being the example of where we are now, and does it look like it will be any better after the elections this year? Well, I did hear that Biden. Uh, is getting more and more of his nominees through. In fact, they said in terms of uh, certain, like judges, he's gotten more judges through than any other president at this time. So he has been successful. But of course, this particular candidate, they, 
you know, definitely <laughs> want to hold her up because they know that it would uh, change the, um, you know, net neutrality role because I'm, she is our, an active proponent of uh, net neutrality. So, um, but I think uh, he's doing a good job, but uh, this whole thing of holding up the nominees in their process, I think is an issue for, uh, in her situation. And uh, maybe more pressure should be put on the, um, you know, people who are holding up, which would be uh, Congress. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I mean, Jay, this sounds like the eye of the needle is now there um, in in the in the Senate. I mean, they're putting through some of these judges, I guess. I mean, Braden has done a wonderful job of getting so many in in his first year, but then there are these other positions that have to go through the Senate too. So, are we up against? And they're they're making it the uh, the eye of the needle, not getting anybody through, and therefore not being able to have any safety. Uh, provisions in place to keep us from getting more tense? What do you well, think? The, well, the answer is uh, the government is not really working. I'm happy to hear that some confirmations have, have happened in the Senate, but a lot of them haven't happened. And, and then there's a lot of Trump appointees like DeJoy who are still in office doing their thing. Um, and the government is, is riddled with you know, blind spots and, and, and failure points uh, that are still in existence from Trump. Um, this, this is not a good thing. So the government is really dysfunctional, lest we forget. And then my, my, my piece is that we only have a certain amount of time to correct this, and it's not moving fast enough. Certainly, the Department of Justice is not moving fast enough. And when we get to, uh, I've said this before, September, October, when caps and uh, balloting ostensibly is supposed to start, um, you know, there's going to be a mess in the country. There's going to be lawsuits and confusion. Um, there's going to be people who don't want to vote, who have no, no confidence in the voting system anymore. And the election, you can say the election has the, the logical prospect of solving some of this, but I doubt it. I doubt it will. I think the Republicans will take both houses. And if you think the Senate is stuck now, wait till then. And not only will the Republicans win a lot of seats, but there'll be confusion. Nobody will know who's who and what's what. And if they lose a lot of seats, they, which is not likely to happen, they will, they will not exceed. They will not, you know, they will not agree to the transfer of power in their respective elections. This is not going in a good direction. You know, my feeling is, as I said before also, we're in a kind of constitutional convention where the whole country is uh, is evaluating its morality, evaluating its its uh, its you know its ethical approach to government, uh, evaluating what it wants to do. Problem is, there's no real leadership uh, to govern that constitutional convention, which isn't really constitutional at all. And at the end of the day, you're looking for chaos, and chaos is another way of of saying the war cries, uh, you know, have their effect. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to mention is that, uh, um, you know, if you look at other countries uh, and you, you take a sort of a sampling of countries which, you know, uh, which wound up in, in horrible straits in Africa and Latin America, um, it, it is a certain pattern and that pattern can be identified here. It, it, the, it's power. Power ultimately comes from the mouth of a gun. That's where power, it comes from physical force. That's how you maintain control and power at the end of the day. Um, and and uh, the other example of it is that you can have governments that are in place, but don't care. They don't care about the public. They care about retaining their ostensible power. They care about um, uh, you know, uh, making money and becoming wealthy and staying in power forever and becoming increasingly wealthy. And when you have that, and when you have government that doesn't care about the people, the social condition or the rule of law that governs the country, then you have a complete breakdown. And, yeah. uh, and, and that I think we're headed to that. Thank you, Jay. Um, let's uh, go around here to finish up as we're um, getting really close to out of time. So. Uh, what do you what what would you like to comment on Tim regarding um, the predicament we're in and its outcome? Um, I, I'd actually like to tag a little bit onto what Jay was saying about potentially losing the House or the Senate, and you know, it kind of you know, I know the media is saying that's what's what's probably going to happen most likely, but I'm still not convinced. And why is that? Well, I think there's things in the air that could 
could possibly happen? What are those things? Um, who knows what the select committee will, final report will look like? Will that motivate people and outrage people so to the point where they get out of their chairs, be it Democrat, uh, independents, and non-Trump Republicans? Uh, will they be so outraged by the details of that report that they, they are actually motivated and make a difference in the voting booths? Um, does, does Build Back Better Part 2 get done? If, do they scrap the existing one and, and rebuild and get something passed that uh, people say, okay, there's an accomplishment. Um, democ democracy is working. This administration is working for us. Does uh, some kind of um, altered voting rights package get, get passed? And, um, you know, so maybe it's accomplishments and maybe it's the select committee's report that could make the difference come um, 2022 and, and 2024. All right, thank you. Winston, briefly, we're almost out of time. Okay, your comments, summation. Yeah, just uh, if we're looking at who are, what we're talking about, I think, well, Jay says power may come from a gun. Yes, that's true in a blunt, gross way. But we have a, a great moral authority in this nation, um, ethical considerations that the huge majority of people follow. Uh, they want to be kind. They want to be helpful. They want to be uh, part of this great experiment. And I, uh, I have faith in my fellow country men and women most of the time. I, and for the few fringe, we're talking a very tiny portion of people who are, it's, it's a criminal element. We just have to recognize them for that. But it is, we need to separate that out and say, this is an enigma to a free society. The rest of us, we're never going to get what we want all the time. And that's part of what it is to be in America. And we're going to continue to have this discussion. I don't know of a better system out there. So uh, we got to protect, promote, and preserve what we got um, uh, across the political spectrum. Okay, thank you. And Karen, yeah, the, there isn't a better system out there, but there are lots of systems to default to authoritarianism and di dictatorships and that. So are you, are you feeling um, good about our prospects going forward and that this is a small minority that we're worried about? Well, I think um, my closing thought was would be um, about Amir Garland. I think he is not uh, being as active as he, I think he should be. And I would like Biden to keep an eye on replacing him. If he Maybe if he's doing more than what I'm seeing. I don't know. And not, uh, you know, not exposing what he's doing. But uh, uh, from what I've read about him in the past, he's one of these people that likes to talk, say things, but he's not big on action. So uh, I guess that would be my closing thought. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, a serious recommendation. Um, uh, we can't go around again because we're out of time, folks. But I think that this uh, is has been a, a, a wonderful contribution of you all to this topic, which is a hard one to talk about. And this show is Politics for the People. And I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Uh, mahalo for your viewership. And uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>